and completely lose yourself. Never really know who you are. This city has abundance of lost boys. Open, honest, non-judgmental way, no shame. Everything is welcome. Anger is a very healthy emotion. Women bring different things to the table. Men bring different things to the table. I don't see promotion of people looking forward to being a father and women looking forward to being a mother. How can something so typical be so unique and incredible? We've got the mental health crisis because men try and be in that role. This is what we signed up for as a man. We are typically more stable. We do think differently, typically. The women rated him last because he was a bit too much. It's giving men direction. I was 17 years old and he said to me, you're man of the house then. Being the man in the private that you also are in public, I feel is what masculinity stands for. We get the majority of our fill in by serving other people. And I also believe that, you know, life isn't short. It can be. Communication can be low. The man that was not liked by the tribe was left behind. Men like to feel needed. So welcome, Adil, to the Warwick Abbey podcast. It is a pleasure to have you on. Thank you so much, man. This is unexpected, but I'm happy to be here. You've got some really interesting opinions and insights into what men are going through. Yep. And you've got those insights from working with communities of men and being a part of them yourself and having yep. gone through a lot yourself and navigating uh, your masculinity as well as helping other men do the same thing, right? Yeah. Uh, for anyone who doesn't know who you are, what you do, can you share with us in 60 seconds what it is you're up to in the world? Ultimately, I'm trying to help men become better men. Let's say that sentence. You know, we hear this phrase toxic masculinity a lot, but I should try to educate men on how can we be more healthy in our masculinity? How can we just be more, be more masculine without it being something which is ridiculed or, or suppressed? Um, and I definitely find that most men don't know what it means to be masculine. You know, I do actually, I have some female clients too. So as long as, as well as working with men, I always work with women. Because the fact that I work with so many men, they're like, okay, well, help me understand, help me understand men. You know, so I knew that too. And I also have something called Brotherhood DXB, which is like a men's support group. We have a, now 200 plus men in the group, are all men that want to do more than just go to brunches and yacht parties and, and all of that kind of stuff in Dubai. And they really want to connect with good guys. A lot of these men out here are lonely. Um, and they want to just make some good friendships and they want to do more with their life and they want to elevate who they are as a man. And that's what we're doing. Brilliant. I think that's, I think that's really important work. Um, I, you know, during this episode, I'd love to talk about uh, mental health for men, why that's yeah. massive in, you know, in terms of an issue and why, that, why we're in a kind of mental health crisis for men. Yeah. Um, you, one of the things you mentioned to me was Dubai in particular is like the city of lost boys. Yeah. Right? Tell me about that. It's like all Dubai, the city of lost boys, because I feel like you can come here and completely lose yourself. I never really know who you are. You know, there's the flashing lights, you've got the fast cars, you've got food everywhere you go, you've got great restaurants, you can go out every single day of the week. There is something to do all the time. There is something that will distract you always, if you let it happen, you know? And I find that that can be incredibly destructive. You never have to face yourself. You never have to face your demons. You never have to even spend time thinking or feeling just, um, I'm feeling a little bit lonely today. I'm going out. Almost like your your kind of immediate needs or impulses are currently are constantly met very very quickly, right? Percent. No, we live in a dopamine fueled world, right? So you can get that. Think, look at all the things that you can get now from whatever you might see on the internet. That's already available. Uh, social connection is always available, even though it's not a real connection, but you still feel connected. It's instant. Mm. Um, a like. It's like a dopamine hit. Um, even deliver. You're no longer working for your food. You're not spending that time cultivating that and taking time to cook now. You just order to something else. It's really such a fast pace. Instant gratification. That's, yeah, so that's the world we live in. We don't earn it anymore. Mm. And, and it could be anything. We just don't earn it. And so that's why this city has you know, an abundance of lost boys yeah. in your video. Yeah. The, um, it's interesting. The last, the last podcast I was on, which was basically, it was a fatherhood podcast, right? And it was... Um, me talking about problems that dads have. It was basically like men's advice for men. And some of the first comments I got were actually um, from women say, you know, you can't talk about this because we experience the same problems and, you know, you can't really isolate this to men, all this sort of stuff. And they were, they were almost angry, um, the comments, you know, towards men talking about their challenges. Yeah. I feel like as a society, we want men to share their feelings and their opinions um, and to share the challenges, the problems they go through. But the second they do, it always feels like they're criticized for doing it. That's my opinion as a guy in looking at 
some of the things I've witnessed, especially in the last few months. Have you ever noticed that? Hundred percent. And I, I can go much to my female clients who come to me about their relationships. I will ask them if he told you your partner a particular truth. Could you just let it be and just be there with him and say, thank you for sharing that with me. And like, how does that make you feel? And or would you make it about you? And they will typically go back and think, yeah, I make it about me. Because a man's truth is so hard to handle because it's, 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 it's difficult for them to, to, to process. They're not, you're not used to it. Even though many women would like a man to be more open, more emotional. I don't know. I just think it also makes them feel a little bit scared at the same time. Vulnerable. Vulnerable, mm -hmm. you know? And then going back to, uh, we spoke earlier about yesterday's men's circle. So every week I run a men's circle where we sit together, we talk about topics that pertain to men. And last night's conversation was around suppression of emotion. What emotions do you suppress? And resentment came up and like, you know, even just wanting to decide where you want to go and eat. A very trivial thing. But when you stack these things over time, it starts to become big things. This is guys talking about the relationships they've got. And in general, all relationships, so just in general. So it's the men's circle, it could be bad in anything. It's their chance to get anything off their chest and just be in an open, honest, non-judgmental way, no shame. Everything is welcome. We don't jump in and we let the man speak. For like four or five minutes, each man gets a chance to talk. It's really nice. Um, and last night, talking about expression of emotions, a lot of the men were saying, in my relationship, there's, I just don't want to speak. Mm. Because every time I say something, I'm going to just hear something back that, you know, about it's about them. Um, you know, you're not the only one that feels this way or just something. The aggro or, and they'd rather just keep silent to keep the peace. And what happens over time of doing that? Suppress, suppress, suppress. Explosion, mm. arguments, anger, blowouts. It could be uh, distractions and going to doing stupid things just to kind of feel better or feel something. Um, or implosion, where you might go into like depression or you just, I don't know what, what that might look like, but it can... It can really severely affect your mental health, you know? I think what we repress, we express, right? In some way. Great little term. What we repress, we express. And it's like, if you're already unable to, to process an emotion as and when it comes to you, yeah. and you force yourself to repress that emotion, it can come out as physical ailments five years, ten years down the line. hundred um, percent. You know, and, and I think that's one of the biggest issues we, we face, right? It's like, how can we encourage men to process their emotions. And then, should we be doing that? Because here's the other way of looking at it. It's like, I feel like in a lot of ways, male mental health is looked at through the lens of a female. I feel like often we look at mental health that, that men experience, and we, we want men to express their emotions all the time. And well, I, th I feel like a lot, of, a lot of those emotions are fueled by hormones. And I think that our hormones, men and women experience very different hormones. And so, if you look at how a, a man you know, expresses his emotions when he's got a heightened sense of testosterone, it's often through anger or frustration. If a, if a guy stubs his toe on a sofa, he doesn't immediately get very sad or upset. It's, it's often the, the automatic response is anger and aggression. Right? Yeah. And that can be very different between the two sexes. So in a lot of ways, some people would argue if you encourage men as a society to express their emotions more freely, are you then encouraging men to let out some of that aggression and that no i just think, i think if we give them tools to help them express their emotions in healthy ways actually to be fair i don't think anger is an unhealthy expression no right i really don't think it is i think that we, the use, we need anger yeah we need it yeah. the use of anger in a maybe a violent form and it becomes an unhealthy expression but if you're just like screaming or shouting or just even shaking or even if you want to punch a punch back you have anger like there's nothing wrong with that Anger is a very healthy emotion. We should let that move through the body. Mm. But I feel like the one way that I feel men process emotions best is to movement. Yeah. Movement and breath. And like, you know, that's why martial arts is so fantastic. It's, we could be, energy is, we need to move energy anyway yeah. through the body. You know, so like I take men through like breath work and meditations and we do like, with the early, we do that like ice bath and stuff. We need to challenge our bodies in ways that allow things to come out without speaking sometimes. Do you think that men have a different role in the, the household or the family unit to, to women? Because I feel like society is trying to blank canvas gender in general. And I feel like we look at men and women and we say, you both have the same role. And part of that's great because it's saying we should have equal opportunities. Mm. But do you think innately we have different traditional roles within the family unit which are healthy to have as separate roles? So yes and no. 
I do believe that we can be we can be equal. I do believe that some relationships can also flow between different identities of gender. I know a guy that lives in the UAE and he's a stay at home dad, and it works for them. Wife goes out and makes the money, it works. The norm, I would say, and what we're kind of more used to and innately kind of what's built in within us is this whole thing around masculine and feminine. So it hasn't got to be man woman. This is masculine and feminine. And I feel like innately us men move towards kind of the masculine traits, right? It's just provision, safety, it's security. We provide the container of all of this and the direction for the family to go in. Whereas the mother is typically more nurturing, caring, uh, more creative, has more passion and compassion, which is why women will typically look after the children. Mm. You know, so it's not about inequality because that's such an important role. Yeah. A woman's role as a mother is so important. And a woman's role in general is so important. We, they, women bring different things to the table. Men bring different things to the table. And so when we're trying to have, be this on this balanced kill, it doesn't work. Mm. And I have women that come to me and say, where are the men? Just that statement. Where are the real men? And I'm like, well, the real men are just feeling suppressed and repressed right now because they don't know what it means to be a man because they're afraid to just step up and be maybe a bit outspoken to say something which they believe in mm. to sound in any way controlling. It doesn't sound right, you know? So how do we encourage men to lead rather than be controlling? I, I totally agree with you that there's a, there's a difference between, it's, it's not about gender, right? And so a lot of society looks at this, tries to make everything black and white. Yep. And I, I, I totally with you when it's about masculine or feminine energy, which a, a woman can have high levels of masculine energy yep. or high levels of feminine energy than a man the, the same, vice versa, right? Yeah. But I do feel like, um, a lot of society criticizes men for having high masculine energy. And they often criticize women for having high feminine energy. If a woman has, is, is very, very nurturing and wants to be a stay at home they're constantly told by society, you need to go out there, you need to be you know, earning money, and you need to be career driven, all this sort of stuff. And I think that's one of the reasons we're seeing women have kids so late. And yep. um, in the same with uh, you know, it, the flip side then um, with fatherhood i feel like there's a huge amount of pressure on um on men not having such high masculine energy and focusing more on feminine energy and being more nurturing and i think that all comes down to having that that balance in a relationship right and it's rather than being gender specific it's more about balance i think we can look at from a macro level society now does not push families it's like it's no longer the object of life to is to raise family like, I don't see anywhere on my social media, maybe I'm not using them, my, my algorithm is not aligned, but it, I don't see promotion of people looking forward to being a father yeah. and women looking forward to being a mother. I typically, what I hear from people that I know, I, from, from women is they get to a certain age and now they're like, okay, I want to be a mom. But I don't, I don't really hear that anymore from the 20 year old, the 25 year olds, I don't hear that I really want to be a mom. I'm looking forward to the day that I'm a mother. I hear about career, which is nothing wrong with that, it's fine. But you have to understand the implication that that has on your children or your future for your children or, or what it, or, you know, even finding a partner. Mm. There's like a pandemic in, in the UAE of, of single people that can't find relationships. Well, wow. there's, there's a whole myriad of reasons for that. And I think that is, again, with being in the city of Lost Boys, um, why would a man, why would a man come here and settle down when they can have whatever they want and they can be as free as they want, you know? It's a difficult place for men to settle out. Yeah, and women, you know? It's, 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 it's a conveyor belt. There's always something shiny in it. I think the best of the world that we live in, especially here. Why do you think there's that pressure on what seems to be the pressure on career instead of building a family as, you know, as, as such an incredible thing, right, to, to be able to create a family as a human being. It's got to be the ultimate human experience. I remember when I first had kids, I was like, you know, for, for so long, I've, I've been doing extreme sports, you know, 500 weeks with base jumps and scholars around the world, yeah. professional fighter and all these, all these things that I'd filled my life with, right? And it was... You know, it's so much adventure. And then eventually I stopped and I had, I, yeah, I met, met my wife and we had kids. And I, and I remember thinking to myself, how can something so typical be so unique and incredible? How can, you know, everyone has kids, right? And so how can me doing this feel like the world's greatest adventure? Yeah. And yet I do see what you're saying. People are, the, the pressure is on not, on not building a family. Why is that the epitome of what we should be searching for as human beings? Why, why is it now a career? We all want to be someone. I feel like this quest for success and this quest for identity is, has now become the thing. Look at the, just going to social media, people know, it's just what we see a lot of, is promotion of, of, of money, success and independence. And I find that 
women have struggled so for so long to be able to do the things that men can do that it's just it's a, it, is, it is of course going to go on that trajectory is going to continue it's idolized mm. women are idolized for being like killing it in the boardroom ceos and it, it is fantastic but i'm just saying like i said it's going to have an impact you know we're no longer looking forward to having children and we're no longer looking forward to creating that family because actually we live in a world now where like you said many men are in their feminine energy not really feeling too masculine women don't feel safe women don't feel safe enough to know where well, okay i can trust a man to kind of handle things mm. and maybe they don't ever want to maybe they're like I'm, I'm fine i want to just make sure i've got my security my nest egg so if a man comes into my life then i'm okay i think it comes down to that security for a woman to be in her feminine energy she needs to feel that she's being looked after uh, she feels safe and secure i don't think we live in a world right now where that is there is that there is that safety oh interesting talking about um processing and repressing emotions. Do you think that typically with the masculine role in the relationship, again, male, female, but most typically male, that we, you know, we, when we look at it like you typically need someone in the relationship at home who is able to handle an enormous amount of pressure yeah. and be the kind of rock when emotions are going around them, right? When there's lots of feminine energy or kids around and you need to kind of be this stable rock. Yeah. I think that's probably one of the biggest reasons men experience a mental health challenge with someone in their lives, or we've got a mental health crisis because men try and be in that role. Yeah. But we still need them to be in that role. Like you still need someone to do that role. It's fine. Right. We need people to be able to handle pressure. So one of the things I think is the most important thing when it comes to mental health isn't just learning how to process emotions, but it's learning how to handle pressure. Um, and a lot of that is down to emotional regulation. Have you seen that? Oh, 100%. So what I get a lot of is men coming to me when they are at wit's end, they're broken, they can't take any more stress, but it's because they, they do stay silent. They don't really seek help. They're not asking for advice. They think they have to handle everything on their shoulders. It's their burden to bear. And a lot of men will say, this is what we signed up for as a man. Right, and I get it. And we all feel that, I feel it. But asking for help is like, no, we shouldn't ask for help. So what happened over time, you know, it gets worse and worse and worse. And we do get that feeling of, oh shit, what am I going to do? Mm. You know, and that's the hard part. That's the hard part. How do we manage that? Um, but this emotional regulation, we are typically better at being stoic, rational, logical. Whereas I find that our counterparts or women in our lives aren't equipped with that same knowledge. Some are, you know, but I said the majority in their feminine are probably about that. Again, hormonal all over the place in terms of the, the levels of the hormones in the body is different to us as men. We are typically more stable. We do think differently. Typically, um, and that's why we have to be, like you said, you said that rock. We are that rock, and but that pressure can become too much for a lot of us. That's why we need to talk. We have to find a way to regulate our emotions. We have to find a way to have that outward expression, you know, ask for help, um, and have the right methods that allow us to just feel free, mm. you know. And I've spoken with um, some of the people that I work with, and when a man expresses his himself in, in being vulnerable especially in the family kind of dynamic, can make the partner feel that I thought he had it. Yeah, I thought, so I thought, they, can, they can start to worry about their safety. Or... I thought he had it, and now I don't know what to do because when he was the one that was leading, and, and if he hasn't got it, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Yeah. And that is also a man's burden to bear. And I suppose that's subconscious pressure. People don't necessarily see, but it attributes to the, the kind of the crisis we might have in mental health. Man. Yeah. I've seen a few, few things on social media. There was one video where one of the guy what well, the the girls were it was a bunch of girls in front of a bunch of guys and the girls were kind of asking the guys questions and then one said oh tell me a time when you last cried and the guy in front it was like a dating kind of mm. the guy in, one of them guys he's, he actually got very emotional but he's talking about his mom and and he's like, oh, i cried the other day and then they had to rate the men the women rated him last because he was a bit too much really but they asked a question that would evoke that well, well this is this is this goes back to what i said at the beginning of this episode which was we want men to talk about our feelings, but as soon as they do, we kind of criticize them or we subconsciously devalue their opinion to a degree, right? Yeah. We, we say things like, well, women experience that, or, yeah. and, I, and I suppose your point of view there is that vulnerability makes the, the family unit a little bit nervous because who's then looking after us if, if that individual, if that, you know. And that's why I believe in the power of the brotherhood, right. is the XB, men coming together as a council when he's speaking to each other, sharing experiences. Like I've got men from 21 to 55. Imagine the wisdom that is shared between, yeah. between these men. 
you don't necessarily have to go to your partner. I mean, I do advocate communication with your partner, but then you can go with it with a little bit more balance, you know, so you're not maybe stressed all over the place and say, oh, I've lost all our money. You can then go to your man, say, this is what's happening, this is what I need. Do you have any advice? But then well, if you go back to your partner and say, look, I've kind of messed up a little bit. This is what the situation is. I've got it covered, but you just need to know the truth. I need your support right now. I'm like, can it be me hard or something? Like, you can go to it differently. Mm. That's why that having male counsel is so important. Totally. I can totally understand that. I think a lot of men struggle to have friends. Yep. I think they, I think brotherhood and camaraderie is so important for men in particular because, you know, it, it's always like there aren't as many role models out there for men. It's a and um, it's a topic. And I, I love what you said about how think of the collected wisdom that's then passed out, right? I think that's really, really important. I mean, I, I spent my life in, in the military, in extreme sports, in um, martial arts environments where you've got typically a room full of other men, very high testosterone, yeah. all trying to better themselves and, <laughs> and pushing to their limits and all this sort of stuff, risk-taking behavior, all the kind of classic yeah. traits. But there's this level of camaraderie, and I think that's really healthy. 100%. And I think that it's, it's giving men direction, right? And having someone, having another man who's older, who's kind of been through it. Maybe they've had kids, they've had difficult relationships, they've dealt with difficult problems. But being able to open up to another man like that is yeah. a lot easier for a lot of guys than actually opening up to a female or their, or their partners. Even. I think that's so true. I mean, look how things used to be back in the day. Even in certain parts of the world, mm. men will sit together, women will sit together. Even here, the majlis, women will go to their part of the house, men will sit, that's what they do, and they're talking. Maybe it's business, maybe it's not, but the boys are looking up at these, uh, their elders and they're, they're learning by proxy. Uh, and everything that's missing from society today is initiation. Right. And I know that within, at least within martial arts, we have graded. In a way, this is an issue. Love, I love that. That whole concept of an initiation from boyhood to manhood. Right. right. I think it's a rite of passage, which I think is a really important phase for young men to go through. Exactly. And we don't have that anymore. Initiation in the UK is you're 18 now, which means that... Go and do what you want. Yeah. Go to the pub. Go to the, the car. What kind of initiation is that? But that doesn't make a man, right? No. I remember when my, my dad left my mum. I was 17 years old, and he said to me, you're a man of the house, then." I said, like, oh, yeah, I'm a man of the house. That meant nothing. I was, like, equipped to be a man of the house. Yeah. I couldn't fix anything. I, wasn't a, I couldn't do any DIY. I wasn't good at plumbing. I didn't know anything. I wasn't earning any money. I thought it would come with some kind of power and status. It came to nothing. It came, I came with a... Came to suffering. Yeah. Unequipped set of skills that didn't know what to do with it. We have nothing that challenges us now. Even when you go into the world of work, you're not really equipped. What do you really learn? You know, when you're going into that, into that corporate world. I, I guess to answer that, that question from, you know, it, having an initiation, having a, some sort of transcendence from boy to man, you, we need to be able to answer the question of what is masculinity? So in, in your words, what is masculinity? What is the pinnacle of masculinity that young men can aspire to? Once? I feel like young men could and should aspire to be honest, have integrity, which means being a man that does what he says he'll do. You know, if you say you're going to do it, you do it. I think that's a very important thing. Be a man of your word, um, having good morals, you know, having a good moral compass, knowing right from wrong, and being the man in the private that you also are in public. You know, being a man that's proactive, solution orientated, is able to take direction, isn't afraid of speaking his truth uh, with honesty and openness. I mean, that he is able to um, accept whatever comes his way as a consequence, not hiding in the shadows and just being bold in it. You know, I feel like these are really strong masculine traits. Really? Um, being sure of yourself. I think confidence is one of them. All the other things that we hear about masculinity is, I don't really abide by it. But I think these are ones that I would at least say I feel is what masculinity stands for. What do you think? What would you add? What I would add to that is. I feel like growing up, to me, masculinity was, it was all about service to other people. Mm. And so service to other people meant looking after the people around you, looking after your family, looking after your friends, looking after your community. Yeah, but the pinnacle of masculinity was ultimately suffering in service, being okay with that. And that word suffering sounds like an awful thing, almost like you're trying to promote poor men to help. I'm not. What I'm saying when I say suffering in service is being the one who's willing to take the most of your shoulders because you're willing to put yourself in very tricky situations where you take on the most risk which is a masculine trait yeah 
which you're able to process emotion because processing and regulating your emotions is is a is a very very important what I would say stoic trait which yeah. is linked very closely to masculinity and I think that society doesn't understand a um, you know having the privilege of 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 uh, you know suffering through service but also doesn't necessarily understand the whole kind of stoic concept and I think that those are two pillars of masculinity for me hundred percent. That suffering bit is a bit that, yeah, I struggle with. But I know a lot of men, if I ask my granddad, for example, he would say, yeah, I'm, I'm glad that I did what I did and I'm proud of, of taking all of that burden because it, it felt good. This, this was my duty. Yeah. And a lot of men in my circle will talk about duty and say, I don't, it doesn't matter what I want. This is what I hold up. It doesn't matter what I want. It just matters that my family looked after, mm. there's food on the table, there's money in the bank. And whilst I agree, I say, what if you could have it all? Yeah. What if you could have what you want and you could do all those things too? You don't have to suppress who you are. Because this is when the midlife crisis comes. Yeah. Men typically, what, 40, 45, 50 years old, think, oh my God, what have I done with my last 20 years of my life? I used to have hair. I used to be able to do what I wanted. I mean, I lost hair quite young, but what am I doing? And what do they end up doing? They end up doing something stupid or they go buy a car or they just try to relive and feel, feel something again. Yeah. To feel youth and do what they want. Go on a boys' trip whatever it's going to be, but it can sometimes come out in quite unhealthy ways, you know? So how do we backtrack and how do we get to the point where you don't have to get to a midlife crisis? You're living your truth. You're living your life. Now, I know there are a lot of dads will be watching this, you know, that maybe they're thinking, what am I, what am I doing with myself? Mm. I'm just living that humdrum life. I'm just go to work, come home or take you to school and come home and working. And I'm just living that same type all the time. I'm not, I'm not living. No. You've got to ask yourself, like, what does that mean? Mm. How can I live my life? What, what, what is it that I really want to do? Bring your partner into the conversation and just have that open dialogue. Just a quick shout out to the guys at Shield who manage this podcast, come up with the strategy behind the podcast, help me schedule interviews as well as do all of the editing and the producing of the podcast. Without them, we wouldn't be able to produce this podcast. If you would like to create your own podcast, I can't recommend the Shield team enough. They have done well over 100 episodes for me over the last few years, and I've been so pleased with the results. So have a look in the description of this video or the podcast episode, and you'll see how to get in touch with them yourself. I think, I think again, that's linked to, to, to the way in which we should be thinking as men, right? It's, it's, it's not living a boring life. It's, it's living a life that has sacrifice, but also you're living a life with courage. If something is not closely aligned with your values, then having the courage to make a change, right? Yeah. You don't want to be in that job for 40 years and you're not enjoying yourself. Yeah. Then I guess I guarantee your family are enjoying it. Because if they know the dad's out there and not enjoying themselves, they're probably not having the best version of the dad. 100%. And so I often think, you know, one of the most important traits for parents is courage. And courage is, is one of those things that, you know, you, you will get in life when you tolerate. Right, and so if you don't have the courage to to kind of set your tolerances and say this is this is me, these are my values, this is what I'm living by, then you know you'll be pushed around. You won't stick in all the things that you say you're going to do because you haven't got the courage to be uncomfortable and stick to those tolerances. Yeah. And so, so courage for me is also one of the things you pass into a kid, right? Yeah. And um, it's it's about encouraging kids to live with courage and speak up for themselves, and and it's, it's often a case that we don't do it ourselves. And if we don't do it for ourselves for long enough, then we have a mental life crisis, right? Because we haven't lived the life we wish we had lived. Yeah. And um, in, a, in a kind of a flip side of that, you've got, and this probably links very much to the, the kind of lost boys aspect of Dubai, is you've got people chasing happiness. And someone asked me on a podcast the other day, um, you know, what's, what's the purpose of life? And I was like, it's definitely not happiness. If we think that it's, you know, that we think life is about chasing happiness, it's a fleeting emotion that comes and goes. If that, if all of life is just about that, those 30 seconds or 60 seconds or five minutes of happiness, that's not it. Life is about fulfillment. And I think as human beings, we get the majority of our fulfillment by serving other people. Yes. And it's, and I think if, if you are a guy who's A, lived your life close to your values with courage yep. and spend the considerable of your life serving other people and feeling fulfilled, Best purpose of life. Listen, this is why I love what I do. I feel fulfilled all the time, you know. And also, I, I find that seeking joy rather than happiness, joy is something which can be ongoing, and you just you wake up joyful. If you wake up with joy and gratitude, mm. 
you don't, you don't need to seek these individual moments, like you said. You know, it is fleeting. Yeah. And, but, and I also believe that, you know, life isn't short, but it can be. You know, we're not, we're not promised anything. And this is where courage comes in, right? yeah. understanding that, you know, that life is, uh, is very impermanent. Yeah. I think that's a really important trait as well, you know, accepting the impermanence of life. Yes. I wouldn't say that's a, that's a masculine or a feminine trait. No, I would just say it's a it's his human trait. Life actually is just really, really important. And, you know, the, the samurai did that, the Vikings did that. It was, you know, if you look back through history, yeah. and, you know, people really understood the, the impermanence of life because life, especially in the, in the past, was very impermanent, right? And so now we're kind of spoiled um, in a lot of ways. And I think because we don't necessarily see that impermanence of life, we lose touch with the gratitude aspect, right? Yeah. You're only really great for things that you, that you don't think you're going to keep forever. Yeah. And maybe in a lot of ways, we think we're going to keep, we're going to keep our happiness or our life or whatever we've got around us forever. And then, you know, as, as, as scary as it might seem, I think a very stoic way of approaching that is, is while you're in that moment where you're experiencing happiness, visualize that impermanence, right? It was like, I read something the other day, which was when you put your kids to bed, picture that's the last time you've been to the bed. That's the last story you're reading them. And suddenly that single moment just becomes the most incredible, most important moment of your life. And then you, if you are finding a way of doing that throughout your life, you've got true fulfillment. I mean, I hope that's what people will think and not just depression. <laughs> yeah. Imagine it was like, oh my God, this could be the last time I see my kid. It can, I think it can go either way. But, but, but I, I mean, you look, at, you look at old school martial arts and cultures, right? They would, they would, they would visualize the worst case scenario. Yeah. And I think visualizing and accepting the worst case scenario forces you to, to be very present and actually enjoy what you're doing. So for me personally, I think the, the enjoyment factor is higher because, because you're focusing on that, not dwelling on it and yes. you know, wallowing in your own sadness, but, but understanding that is the things around you are impermanent and you should be grateful that you've got them, yeah. not just expecting them and, you know, not necessarily appreciating them. I just, I just think gratitude is the attitude and being present. I'm trying to live my life now as present as possible. If I feel something, I'm, I'm going to express it or say, if I see something, I'm going to get it. I told you a story right, just earlier, but me going speaking um, to a lady in the, in the cafe, it's important just to be, mm. be here today. You know, that's just the most, for me, the most important thing. Um, yeah, gratitude is the attitude. Gratitude is the attitude. Yeah, I like that. What advice would you give to to dads in Dubai who are kind of feeling that um, middle life crisis approaching, and they're looking at it like, oh my god, you know, I haven't done the things I want to do. Yeah. What would you What would you say to them? Figure it out what you want, what it is that you actually want to do. What are the things that you feel are missing? What emotions are you not experiencing right now? And and really, what would you like to do? You know, and look at the areas in your life that you're not happy with as well. We can look at both. What is the thing? What are the things that you like that you that you want more of, and what are the things that you want less of, and then get them in the list and start working toward the things that you want, and start eradicating the things that you don't. You know, and I know that can maybe take a little bit of, you know, uh, that could be quite testing mm. to do those things. It might be cutting out certain friendships. It might be. You've done this with guys in your group. Can you, can you give an example of some of the? You know, things so one of so one of my clients, he was severely lacking confidence, right, and he was unhappy, and he said to me, you know, even with my friends, I'm the butt of the jokes all the time. At work, me and my colleague are the same level, but he makes me do stuff for him. And I just, I, you know, I don't really feel that confident. He does most for us. And he said, you know, if I could knock him out if I really wanted to, but I just don't feel confident enough. Um, and there's two things that were going on. One, I could see his demeanor, it's very low and soft, and also his hair was thinning. And I said to him, first thing you're gonna do is you're gonna shave your head. He's like, what? And he goes, oh, you know, I was thinking about it, but I thought, no, what my family gonna think? I said, what do you want? I said, look, right now your hair is owning you and this little wispy thing you have going on just doing you, it doesn't do you any favors. But I, I felt that there was a connection between this and his confidence. Mm. So I told him to shave it. Next thing I said to him to do is I said, write down all of the times you wish you had said something to the people that are around you or in your life where you, you know, you've been put down or you know, made the butt of all the jokes. Just write it down. That's the work. That was week one homework. Week two and week three will work on how, what you would need to say next and how you would do it. And then you've got to go and do those, the things that you want to do. He skipped weeks one, two, and three, went straight to week three, started telling everyone what he thought about at work, his friends and everything, shaved his head. He, the way he came back to me, the oh, was different man. Really? Different man. He walked his talk. He was confident. These, those same friends that were, you know, making him the butt of the jokes were asking him now for advice mm -hmm. and saying, what happened? And 
I, I couldn't believe it. I wish I could work with him for longer, but I didn't need to. Mm. He just needs that one little push to just speak his truth. Yeah. That was it. The hair thing was just an extra. I want everyone to be bored. Um, <laughs> but speak up. The men that are going through things right now where they think I'm not living my life, speak up to yourself at least first. What is it you want? What do you want to feel? What's missing? What did you used to do? You know, are there certain people in your life that you would like to spend less time with? You know, why? It's still we have to have that conversation. And I always say, bring your family into the conversation. Once you know what it is that you want. Mm. Because it can be scary for your family to see you suddenly want it to be different when they've seen you a certain way for so long. And I've seen this again with some of the clients I'm working with. This is what a midlife crisis looks like, right? Right. When the family are watching you totally change over the night, it's like, is he okay? Bring him in. You've got to be able to tell your partner, maybe your kids, if they're old enough, this is what's going on. And I need some help. Mm -hmm. And this is what I'm going to do. I'm still here. I ain't going nowhere, you know? And you'll be surprised at what can really happen for you. And you, because hopefully you've still got many, many more years of your life to live and you're going to love it. It's interesting. I think one of the, one of the biggest challenges men have is communication, right? Yeah. W whether that's with each other or with our families or with our wives and whatever it is. Yeah. Do you think it's just because we'd be repressing what, or avoiding saying what we think? Well, we're taught to be the strong, silent type. Mm. Even that, strong and silent. Mm. We want to be strong. So when you hear strong and silent, it's like, okay, that's, what, that's what we do. We just keep, we keep quiet and just get on with it, you know? And if we do speak, like we've said, if we do speak up, then potentially there might be repercussions that we don't want to hear. Um, but also equipped with that. And that's just why I also feel like empathy and compassion come in. Mm. And where the hormones come in that we might be more reactive, more like direct. And that directness and also our tone, our tone can get us in so much trouble. Mm. It's got me in a lot of trouble. I always say, don't listen... Listen to what I say, not how I say it. <laughs> just, just, just listen logically, please. But at least on that, though. Yeah. We're not, that's where we have to learn it. Communication can be learned. You know, and often when it comes to the dynamics of a partnership, it's not, things can, can get lost in translation just because of the way, so, way that things are said. Yeah, that's very true. I, I genuinely believe that we need to get better at communication. And it's not outside of your reach. Every man can be better at communication. Mm. We're communicating right now. And I'm sure we can have even amicable discord. If a topic came up that we weren't aligned with, you know, we could do that. Mm -hmm. And that's what we need to get better. And also being comfortable with that vulnerability of expression. And know, first of all, you have to know it within yourself. And that's why that introspection and self-reflection is so important. Why I encourage men to meditate and journal. Because if you can understand your emotion first, it makes it easy for you to articulate what's going on. Mm -hmm. And to speak to someone else. I, th I think what you said about having a disagreement with being healthy is, you know, is, is really important. I think um, to like men especially nowadays, is struggling with confrontation. I think, they're, I think they are almost allergic to confrontation, right? Where, when actually having a disagreement is healthy and should, and should be had. One of the things I always say is, I kind of seek out awkward conversations because, you know, if you, if you sit down with somebody and say, I need to have a bit of an awkward conversation with you, you set the, you set the tone and it's like, now we're actually going to have a conversation which we might agree with yeah. about something I'm not happy about or you're not happy about or whatever. But we seem to be very timid and kind of really around that. Like, I, you know, and I, I see... A lot of guys doing that, whereas instead of being upfront and just saying what they thought or what they feel, they kind of bounce around and there's a gossip and all this. They avoid it together, you know. I actually had a man reach out to me the other day. Um, I was with him and I, I made a comment there and it was made with, it, with Jest. Um, and uh, he sent me a voice note. And we went and met a few times. He sent me a voice note. He said, listen, you said something just now and I didn't like it. That always set him off for me and I don't appreciate it. And it was like a two-minute voice note. It was very direct to the point. And I just said, listen, I value that. Thank you for sharing that. But I had no idea how you felt. And yeah. thank you. And I won't do that again. It was meant with no, with no uh, animosity. It was real love. And that was it, done. There you go. Well, imagine if he had harbored that. Yeah. If he had that was not then but built. Exactly. The depression. What we repress, we express, right? It, it's interesting. The, um, you know, if you, don't, if you don't share something you're unhappy with, how that that festers and becomes a you know a real um, you know you can that you can you can build a disdain for someone and really start to you know is to have such a negativity around that relationship yeah. until it completely fizzles away entirely right 100 percent. so if we want to foster this healthy relationship if we want the relationships that we say we do we have to put the work in but this is very linked to what i said earlier about tolerances i feel like a lot of people don't speak their minds and they accept things they don't accept it or they, or they, but they, but they don't, but they don't fully. Well, they do accept, right? Because they're not saying acceptance means I, I'm okay with what is, 
and it's not going to have any kind of negativity rolling around in me. But the response to the other person is that they've accepted that comment. That's toler- I feel that's tolerance. But they have, so they've, they've tolerated someone else's behavior rather than saying, I don't tolerate that, that you know, I've reached the limit on my tolerance. Yeah. And so that for me is, is something that we, we need to do so that we're not pushovers, we're not you know, doormats, we're not being walk away, bro. Exactly. The bundle of jokers who say yeah. it. Boundaries are so important to be able to set, and we're not taught how to set boundaries or to say no. Why is that? Do we lack courage? We, we, we don't, we like to be the nice guy. Why do we like to be the nice guy? Because we want to be part of society. We want to be liked and loved because traditionally, and if you go just through kind of, um, kind of from an innate way, the man that was not liked by the tribe was left behind. If you were a troublemaker, if you were not playing ball, you were left. So do you feel we've got a generation of nice guys because we fear social rejection? 100%. We want, we want identity, we want to be loved, we want to be socially accepted. Why rock the boat? Mm. If you rock the boat, you're going to get ousted. You know, and you do, oh, yeah, these days you get cancelled yeah. by, by speaking your Why can't we just speak our drink? Yes, someone's not going to be okay with it. Fine. I have to, I have to accept any criticism on my way because I'm in the public eye. This is what I do now. This is what, this is what comes. But even the everyday person will have their own thoughts. I'll just think about the thoughts that just aren't said out loud. Mm, we, we, we've all got those that we just think no I'm not going to say that because maybe I'm going to be in trouble or maybe it's just not a, a thought that is shared among many I think there's a there's a time and a place to say something there right like if, if you're just constantly outspoken you're probably quite annoying to be around but if you if you are um, I agree. if you're if you're saying something with the point of I'm trying to improve the relationship by, by letting you know these are my values this is what I'm happy about then I think that's no no exactly good shout out right? no, 100% like yeah if you're someone that's always speaking out then we all know that one person who's really outspoken and it's it's just kind of difficult no one can really completely relax i mean your social situation because they're just constantly outspoken you know that they're gonna cause an argument or something they're gonna have something to say yeah um they i i completely agree balance Mm. balance is key um but the key thing that comes out of all of this stuff is i just want men to move away from being the nice guy and just be a good man yeah. And I really think there's a distinction between those two things. You know? Totally a distinction between being nice and being good, being a good man versus being a, a nice man. I feel like a, I feel like if you're overly nice all the time, it's actually quite hard to be good because you're not sticking true to your values or something. And if someone is not sticking true to their values, but they're constantly nice, can you trust them? Exactly. So often, or I would say a typical trait of a nice guy is him, you know, relaxing on his boundaries to make other people feel more comfortable. And people pleasing. Bend over back. People pleasing. But the difference is that he typically wants something back in return. Mm. You know, just imagine those nice guys that have those female friends that just, they're always around, they're always like, just being sweet and stuff. What's he, the agenda? He, yeah, what's the agenda? He, he wants to be in that woman's like life, social circle or something, and maybe something might happen with them, but it's not going to work. And if he doesn't get what he wants back, or maybe suddenly now she's dating someone else, it's gonna, he's going to drop. So he wasn't a good man. He just um, would have the courage to say what he wanted, you know, and... I think this goes back to that social rejection, isn't it? The fear of social rejection. Yeah, we haven't touched on that, really. Well, the fear of social rejection. Yeah, but I mean, like, I guess as a man feeling rejected, okay, by women, for, as an example, mm-hmm. you know? That's so, a, is that a stronger social rejection than being rejected by men? Yeah. For heterosexual world, okay? So, men are afraid, to, and I see in my men's group, so I have a, I have a WhatsApp group with all the men in it, mm-hmm. and it's a common thing. You know, these men are afraid to go and talk to women because they're afraid of rejection. Oh, yeah. you know, what, what if she says that? So, so what? So what? Why are they so afraid? But on the flip side, I hear from women that the ma- man approaching them is creepy. So, so what, what, what do we do? What do we, how do we handle that? How do we approach a woman without being creepy? Or, is it, or are they already looking through uh, the world with that lens mm. that a man approaching them is, is creepy? What's it, what are we supposed to do? Where does a man fit in this kind of masculine feminine world right now and in the social construct of um the dating world mm. it's a difficult terrain it's and a, now we the, the, i think the dating world has totally changed we hide behind apps mm. so apps take away the social anxiety of having to go up to someone and like oh my god is you know what am i going to say and and just deal with it that's also how confidence is built confidence is competence over time you know you do things with enough repetition you will become more confident at it so if you keep shying away from the hard things, or they're hard at the beginning, because at the beginning of everything, it's going to be difficult, you're, going to, you're never going to build that confidence. You're never going to be competent at it, mm. you know, in the first place, because you haven't done it enough repetitions. 
Do you think facing rejection is more commonplace with men than women? Yeah. Especially the dating world. Yeah. Do you think it's an important part of being a man that you're able to process and face rejection? Yeah. In general. And, and then therefore we're preventing that with um, you know, the rise of social media dating apps as well. Yeah. So everything's there to make life easy. Let's make this go straight back. What's that cycle? You know, for e easy life, it makes weaker men, and weak men make those. Yeah, that one. What's, what's, what's the what's the phrase? On the brew there if I try it. Okay. <laughs> okay. But there's well, you get the concept, right? Is it's when we're becoming a society of weaker I think people. Mm. You know, I do think our women are becoming stronger, to be honest. Like they're they're far more um diligent, hard working, they're out there just, you know, making huge changes in the world. And I find that men are I mean we mentioned it earlier, maybe losing their place. Where do they fit now? Losing their social contract. The traditional the traditional male is losing his social contract in society. Do you think um, do you think women are, are, are becoming stronger because there's more opportunities for them, or do you think it's because men are becoming weaker? I think it's both. Mixture. I think it's both. To be honest, so no, we, how would we measure that? But uh, I do think I do think it's. Do you think women you are getting stronger, also desire a, a man who is on their same level, and now they're struggling to find that? I think that they actually want someone that's better, that's stronger, right? Because when women date across and up, right? Ooh. This is hypergamy. Um, so if they're becoming more powerful, more financially free... Status. The women are trying to say this. Yes. Status, power, all that kind of stuff. If they're already here and the men are just aren't competing at the same level, of course it would get harder. That dating pool becomes a lot smaller. Mm. You know, it becomes more difficult. And those guys that just have a, you know, a 30,000 pound, 40,000 pound a year job, for example, um, are not even looked at. Most men feel invisible. It's, it's such an ingrained challenge in society, isn't it? When, you know, when we, when we are constantly telling men not to, um, to focus on career and be, have more feminine qualities, be more nurturing, we're telling men to do the opposite. But then when it goes out there, the real world, the dating world, you've got a completely, you know, challenging position there. Yeah, it's, 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 it's incredibly challenging. And a lot of the women I work with are in the kind of, kind of it, uh, 30 plus, hitting 35, 36, 37, and it's, it, gets, it does get harder as you get older. Mm. You know, because you also know what you want. Um, you've built yourself now. You're 100% being comfortable by yourself. You, you, I know you just don't want that. Um, but men find it challenging, you know, because maybe they feel under par. They don't feel like they can be on that same level as you. Um, maybe they're not. Maybe they are. Does it, it doesn't really matter. But it does become more challenging because I feel like the, the bar has been set so high. It's, it's a good thing. It should encourage men to kind of want to be raising their standards mm. You know, unfortunately, I just don't think it's having that, having that effect. So women are raising their standards and raising their status within society. While it should encourage men to do the same, you don't think it is. You think it's actually disempowering men. And yeah. that, you know, at least a, a proportion of men are looking at that and saying, what's the point? Yeah, what's the point? And they're not being, they're, not just, they're just not being given a chance either. Ooh. You know, um, and maybe now they're dating younger. There's go again, go for what's easy. Mm -hmm. Maybe not even trying to see how they can make a relationship work with someone that has more power status than them without feeling insecure or intimidated. That's another thing, right? Yeah. So this, they, the other phrase is fragile masculinity, which again, I don't like these, these terms. It doesn't matter. You just feel insecure. Insecurity can be felt by both men and women. Feminine mask does not matter, mm -hmm. okay? You feel insecure because innately you do feel like part of the masculine or, or uh, trait is to be a provider. You know, and if you feel like that part of your role in the relationship has been diminished or taken away and not managed properly, then it can make you feel, what does she need me for? Mm -hmm. Men like to feel needed. We really love feeling useful. needed. We like feeling useful and needed. Mm -hmm. And if we don't feel like either of these two things, and that she can do by herself, what? Yeah, I think it's really interesting. Let's talk about toxic masculinity. Um, Massive buzzword yep. these days has been for the last five years. Um, my kind of view on toxic masculinity is that there is a huge focus and emphasis placed on what men shouldn't be, yep. but not placed on what men should be. Yep. Especially with young boys growing up, we talked about the, the social contract of young men. We don't really know what we need to be, want to be, or should be. And so often they have role models which are brilliant in some ways because they raise their drive and they tell them, you know, you should grow up into this. But they focus so much on status where, you know, it's like, if you want to be a man, you need to have fast car, watch, live like this. And the thing we does not matter, I think I know you're talking about. Right, look, you know, look, well, there's lots of, you know, out there, right? Look successful, even if you're not. And while I understand that might attract, attract the other person, for me, that's not like the pedicle of masculinity, right? And I feel like 
that is what we're teaching young men to grow into. But when it comes to toxic masculinity, that energy and that focus is saying men shouldn't be this, they shouldn't be that, they shouldn't be assertive, they shouldn't be overconfident, they shouldn't be aggressive, they shouldn't, you know, all these different things. We don't have that focus on what men should be. Yeah, and I also think it's linked heavily to misogyny, which is also a mis mis um, uh, misused and overused word that many don't understand what it means. So these two things together aren't helping society. It's not helping the conversation. Mm. How do we help the conversation? If what you want, like you said, is for the opposite to happen, why are we talking about toxic masculinity? Again, I don't, I've told you my stance today, I don't really believe that this is something that exists. You know, we, I believe that everyone can be a, a crappy person and we move towards being a moral, good man, a good person, same with women, be a good woman, and whatever that means to so you, know what that means, you know. So how does it behavior rather than yeah. toxic masculinity? Yeah. Behaviors can be toxic, because the reason why I feel that way about that, that phrase, I don't know where it came from, I don't know who coined it, mm. and that maybe that will give a clue as to how that even came out in the first place. I will come back to you on that one. But I believe that femininity is pure and, and, and beautiful in its, in its essence. It can't be toxic. And masculinity is also pure and strong in its essence and it can't be talked to. Those traits are strong. A man not speaking up is not masculinity. Mm. That's not, I don't see that. It might be typical of men, but it does not define masculinity. Exactly. No. So that's where, that, that's where my stance comes in. I've got a lot of rap for it from my last like, talk on, on, the, on this topic, yeah. um, obviously from women, um, but I stand by it. But it's, this all goes back to, we are constantly telling men that these innate, typical um, behaviors of men, um, we're labeling them as masculine, and then we're saying they are toxic. You know, men are so avoidant then of, of any behavior that's kind of slightly out of light, right? Right, so why would they so speak the, up? The nail that sticks out gets hit now first. And so why would we speak up? Why would we, why would we uh, express our truth? Why would we maybe say to our partner, I don't know what you wear? Mm. Why would Because it would be immediately deemed as toxic masculinity, right? Toxic masculinity, controlling, misogynistic, like all, all these words will come out and they each their own on, it, on all of these topics, right? Mm. But the expression of truth and just how you feel, and again, it always comes around full circle. A man should always be, know truly why he feels what he feels, in my opinion, so that he can express himself properly. So that it doesn't come out in those, in those negative ways, which then get attributed to masculinity. Yeah. You know? Do you think there's a flip side to toxic masculinity that women experience as well, I, which could be toxic femininity? Obviously, we don't believe in this so that they are specific terms, but society using those terms. I've not even heard it being used, which is also quite weird. But then there's surely, if you believe that one gender could have toxicity, then the other would as well, right? 100%. There's a balance with everything you like. Yeah, I don't know what that looks like. Well, well maybe, maybe it looks like women who are in their feminine and are building and creating a, you know, very nurturing, building a family and wanting to be stayed at mums are being criticized heavily by their peers in society for not having a career and not being, you know, getting out by earning money, this sort of stuff. Well, maybe, they might even call that toxic masculinity though. They would call that toxic masculinity. They might, they might call that being else. Yeah. Because for example, they might associate that kind of drive towards career, money, finance, status as masculine traits. Interesting. So, I don't, I don't know. Maybe toxic femininity is using your kind of, your, your femininity to manipulate or, or I don't know, just get your way throughout life or I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know what that, look, what that looks like. Yeah, I, I, I think emotional manipulation would certainly be a, a, a toxic feminine trait if there was one, right? Because if you're trying to standardize a certain trait within a certain gender, then you're clutching your straws either, either side anyway. Yeah. You know? but, but yeah, that's, that's a really interesting point. When I, when I started the, um, the War Academy, it was actually with a group of young men, right? And I, you know, they were 16, 17 years old. Yeah. And it was an inner city gym. And, and they were, it was a Thai boxing club and they were, they were going through a really difficult time and lots of social challenges. There was substance abuse. They were mm. relationship challenges. They were kicked out of their homes or although they were sleepy rough sometimes. They were unhealthy relationships to home with parents or family and so on. So they'd go to this club and just let off steam. And they didn't care about martial arts. They just wanted to let off steam and they let out aggression. They had all this pent up energy and emotion. And it was coming out in the physical form within that club as fighting within a controlled environment. And when I first walked in there, they, um, you know, they, they were, it was, you could, you could see the testosterone in the air. You cut it with a, with a knife, right? And then um, it, was, it was interesting for me because I had to, first of all, win their respect. Yes. You know, if you're in that environment with other men, you've got to, first of all, for them to respect you, you need to 
especially I was kind of their age. I was only 19 and they were 16, 17. And so I would join in with them all the time, do the sparring with them. Whatever I asked them to do, I would do even more. If it was fitness, if it was sparring, whatever it was, right? And um, it was amazing because my focus with, you know, at that, at that point I was professionally fighting in Thai boxing, but also had a background of traditional styles like Taekwondo, was all about trying to give these guys a moral compass. And I, and I realized after a while, I've kind of would take their shoes off, bow as they entered, call each other sir. Initially, it was just like, no way. And then when I won their respect, they started to see, you know, they started to see value in, in my opinion and the way that I was teaching them. They wanted them to live a more healthy life. Like yeah. Within a year, you know, they were bowing to each other, calling each other sir, taking their shoes off, never missing a class, not being up the weekends, living a healthy life. We had 15 national champions within 12 months. And their life was completely turned around um, and so for me, it was amazing to see how you take an environment which is masculine, but clearly you're not working, right? And you give them a role model which has a, a strong moral compass that's built clean sense and kind of steered my strong values, old school, traditional, what I would call masculine, you know, traits in a very, very positive way, guiding them was an absolute game changer for them. And ultimately that's why I started the Warrior Academy because I realized that if I could work with these guys within one year when they were almost adults and change their lives, imagine if we could just work with them when they're younger. You know, what an impact that makes to, to young men and you know, women as well, but in that club specifically, it was, it was men. And I think, well, it will help women. Yeah, and I, and I, think, um, I think some of the biggest challenges that these guys could have faced later on in life we may have steered them off, 100%. right? I knew, I knew. The midlife crisis is the mental health challenges. So even just losing their life really early, mm. you know? But I've also felt that if we can get into working with children younger or working with children, it would completely change society. Imagine we had every child in martial arts. Mm. What world would we live in? Yes, you'd probably get some crazy fighters that want to just knock everyone out, but I feel that the majority that learn discipline will create a world of really good men, you know, which in turn will create a safer world for women, and then so and so, and it will, and it will continue. Um, I'd actually, you know, even encourage the dads listening to, how can you be that role model for not just your children, but for others? You have a duty. You're not just the father of your children, you're the father of all children. That's how I see it. You know, we have a responsibility. And so go back to like giving back and service. This is also part of that, you know? It's, no man is an island. We don't have to just be on our own all the time and just think about our little unit. Yes, get off to your unit, but how can we spread? How can we give more? How can we give back to society? How can we give you know, back to organizations like this you know, and bring more people to this? Mm. I think that's key. I think, I think your work's very, very important. I think that the, the, your, your clear message is for men to speak up. Yep. And I think that one of the best routes to do that is to form a brotherhood or where there's camaraderie, where there's trust, where there's wisdom being shared. Yeah. Um, and that's what you're doing with your, with your, with your group. A hundred percent. So the, the, the foundation of the group is the other's oh, weekly man cave. I call it the man cave men. Because okay. <laughs> we need that place where we can go to this hours, mm. you know, where we can just be ourselves. And then I run all these like workshops and talks and things that are also there to build the man from finance workshops to intimacy workshops. Uh, we had one last week about how to kind of basically maintain your car. Things that we've, we've forgotten or we don't do anymore, yeah. you know. Most men I know can't change the tire. Or mm. well, they don't know how to change the oil in the car. At least know, at least know that when you go to a mechanic, you're not gonna get ripped off. Let's empower ourselves, you know? So we've got the emotional aspect, we've got the physical aspect, also health and fitness, we also got all that thrown in. And it's just a subscription. So men just pay like a, what, 150 dirhams a month in part of this group. And they get access to all this stuff and discounts and partnerships and everything. Amazing. And it's, it's on the rise. That they'll, they'll be, I'm sure one day we'll have 5,000 men in the group, if not more. But you know, I'm, I'm seeing these groups kind of appear, it's not all the same, but similar around the world, right? But I think men are being drawn in, you know, towards that more and more as they kind of feel they're losing their, their place in society. And yes, and when they get into it, they're always apprehensive before they join. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or when they're there, they feel it. Mm -hmm. And they're like, yes, and they keep coming back. You know, I had like four new, new men yesterday that found me through like meetup.com or somewhere. They found it and they were just, they couldn't believe that there were this many men sitting in a room just being that open and honest with each other yeah. as if we've known each other for years. But actually some had just been there for the first time. Do you think that men find it easy to open up around other men than around their families or around other women? Yes, but when they're given permission to do so and when they see other men doing it. It's got to be the right context. Yep. And if they are able to do that, then their mental health significantly improves. 100%.
a lot of the men that have committed suicide, as an example, no one knew what they were going through. There's a really powerful um, video that came out recently with from Norwich Football Club. Yes, I saw this. Yeah, I commented yeah. on that one. I shared it and, and shared my, my thoughts on it. I, I think that, was, that was a really powerful video. You expect me, there's two guys, yeah. for anyone who hasn't seen it, there's two guys, um, you know, sitting down. You, you see them at the game every single, it's like a time lapse. Yeah, like every week. 20, 20 games, this thing goes through, whatever. And there's one guy really quiet. And the other guy is really, really happy and, you know, trying to encourage the other quiet guy to, uh, to kind of, uh, you know, enjoy the game more. Yeah. And the choir guy, you know, every single time just looks almost kind of more solemn every week. Yeah. And then suddenly, you know, you get to one of the games and the, the happy guy isn't there. Yeah. And then up, up comes the label, you know, what was it say? It's not always the one that you think that is yeah. going through the hard times. Yeah. Like Often the one who appears the happiest as a defense mechanism, I guess. And yeah. That's what I mean. Like when you go out and you see these people that are the life of the party. And, I, and I've been there. But I'd go out every single weekend and I'd go home and cry. Mm. And I was so, like, I feel so alone. You know, I had so many people, but I was so alone. Right. That's just because you didn't feel like you had a way to communicate and share what you're going through. Yeah. You know, it, just doesn't, it doesn't feel good. And I think a lot of men feel that and they feel alone. Yeah. There's a phrase that's gone around that, you know, most men live a life of quiet desperation. We just want things to be different. Mm. But we don't. We don't make that change. So let Brotherhood DXP be the platform for change at the Warwick Academy. Let that be the platform for change to be just be better, be happier, you know, um, be present, be grateful. Uh, and live a life that you want. Amazing. I do. Brilliant, Shana. This is so good. Really, really good. This is so Thank you. Thank you. I really hope you enjoyed today's Warrior Academy podcast episode. We're going to keep creating these episodes because I know that so many parents find them useful or get insights or get ideas about how to develop their child's character. But it all comes down to the three C's, confidence, conduct, and concentration. So if you want to get a deep insight into the levels of confidence your child has, the level of concentration they have, or the level of conduct they have, so that you can actually put a score next to it and then work towards increasing those scores like we do in the Warrior Academy, then I'd love to invite you to fill in the breakthrough area assessment. It takes about five minutes of your time and you will get a personalized PDF report on your child's three C's. To access the breakthrough area assessment and find out your child's three C's score, all you need to do is go to www.breakthrougharea.com.